Well, hello friends, Coach Bob with you. And today we're going to talk about three things, yes, three things, that just might save your life or may save a finger or a toe <laughs> or a broken bone or something of that nature or could keep you from getting stranded on the side of the road. So if you want to know what those three things are, then what you need to do is make sure you give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and do all that good stuff. I'd appreciate it. All right, so through the power of YouTube, we are gonna hop to the old garage and we are gonna show you a few things that are gonna get you safe. So three things that'll save your life. Is this hyperbole or is this reality? I'm gonna tell you, this is reality. I had someone email me in the last couple of weeks. In fact, I've gotten a lot of emails on touring. What kind of gear do I recommend? Uh, how can you do it safely? Um, how do you physically prepare for 12 hour days on the motorcycle? So I'm gonna be doing some videos over the next few weeks talking about those things specifically. I got a dog drinking water over here. Hey, are you done? Thank you, okay. <laughs> I guess he's not done. You know, being a famous YouTuber, man, your dog doesn't even respect you. <laughs> so is it hyperbole? Am I making this stuff up just for clickbait or is this real? I'm gonna tell you, this is real. This is the stuff that I do and there's a reason behind every bit of it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each thing that I do. And some of the things you're gonna say, Bob, that really isn't necessary and that's okay. You don't have to do it. Again, you can wear khaki shorts, flip flops, sunglasses, whatever you wanna wear, but I'm gonna wear what I wear. And I would suggest that if you wanna be safe, that you don't do the khaki flip flop. Huh? All right, so let's get started. The first thing everyone needs is a quality helmet. Now, this is a showy GT Air. You can see it says CB3 on it. This is my uh, track day helmet. Doesn't have a camera mount or anything on this thing anymore. This is an excellent, excellent helmet. The GT Air 2 is the one that's out now, but do I recommend a full face helmet? I do. Is a full face helmet necessary? Well, I don't know. What's your chin worth um, if you slide down the pavement? You know, Coach Vic, she loves her open face helmets. I'm just gonna tell you. And there's not a whole lot I can do to convince her that she needs to wear a full face. She wore a full face on the last trip, but due to the weight of the full face and the confinement of it, she really finds it very uncomfortable and very unnerving for her. It, it really, it gives her a sense of claustrophobia. She's not real fond of it. So what is she gonna do in the future? I don't know, but she has to make that decision. But a quality helmet, is step one, showy, AGV, um, obviously Arai, uh, Bell. There are a lot of good helmets out there. If you have a helmet and I didn't name it, don't be offended. There's a lot of good helmets out there, but you need a quality helmet. You need to put it on every time you ride. Am I gonna lie to you and tell you that I've never gotten on the Spider without a helmet? I've driven a half mile down the road to put gas in the Spider without a helmet, wearing nothing but my blue jeans, tennis shoes, and a pair of sunglasses. Is that wise? No. Could a truck hit me and kill me between here and there? Yes, but I'm assuming the risk, and that's what you have to do. How much risk am I willing to assume every time I get on a motorcycle? So step one is a good quality helmet. The next thing that is an absolute requirement as far as I am concerned, I'm gonna get this helmet out of the way. Is the pose to the table getting more full? It should get more empty as we do this video. But the next thing you have to have is a jacket. Yes, a jacket. Now, any of you who have been watching this channel for a while know that this is my favorite jacket. This is the, the Joe Rocket, uh, the Phoenix jacket, the Ion, the Phoenix Ion. This jacket I've had for years. It has level one armor in the shoulders. 
in the elbows, and I have a level one armored back pad also. This jacket has a rain liner in it. It also has a thermal liner in it as well. This jacket is also mesh. I've worn this thing in 110 degree heat, actually higher than 110 degree heat if you've ever watched our California trip, all the way down to the teens and it has served me well. Is it comfortable in the teens? No, it is not. Is it comfortable in 110 degrees? No, it is not. Nothing is comfortable in those temperatures. However, a good quality jacket you need. I, I consider the helmet and the jacket, that is step one and step two. If you don't have those, when you get a motorcycle, go out and buy those first. And I'm going in order of importance, I believe. I believe your helmet is first, and your jacket is next. So what would be number three? All right, number three may come as a surprise to some people. I, I thought about making the pants or the boots number three, but I opted out of that and I went with the gloves. Maybe it's because I value my hands a lot and I know that if I was to damage anything, my head and my body are protected, but if I lost fingers and hands were broken all up, I would have a hard time doing anything. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about gloves, what I wear when I tour, and what I wear when I ride more aggressively, and how I wish a company would kind of cross these two pair of gloves. So let's talk about the uh, Alpine Star SMX2 glove. This is a good quality glove. This is a wrist level glove. Yes, I said wrist. It Velcros on. You want something that is going to Velcro securely to your hand. If you make the trip down the concrete, the first thing that this thing that is going to happen, if it's not secured to your hand, is it's going to pop off. And yes, they do. If you've ever watched accident videos, people who don't have a pair of actual riding gloves, they slide and that glove ends up somewhere on the road. Your gloves should be somewhat snug, form-fitting, not to the point of discomfort, but certainly to the point to where they don't feel like winter gloves that you're just wearing to go to a football game. These things are form-fitting for your hand. The reason I like Alpine Stars so much is that they are pre-curved. So these things are curved already. So when your hand sits in it, it's in a position to ride a motorcycle. These are what I would consider minimalist gloves for me. Now you may wear fingerless gloves and we'll talk a little bit about fingerless gloves, but fingerless gloves, as far as I'm concerned, are a bad idea. They may look cool. Rocky might've worn them when he was collecting money from people. Yo, but gloves with fingers in them are very important. We'll talk about that in a minute. Carbon fiber knuckle protectors, uh, protection along the back of the hand, protection layers sewn in, extra layers around the thumb, extra layers along the pinky, extra layer in the palm, extra layer here with a pad within that layer. These are like, again, this is what I would consider minimal. Now, if I had my way, I would take this glove and these two fingers, the pinky and the ring finger would be stitched together. Yeah, they'd be stitched together. You would have two fingers that could move independently and these two would have to move together. That is how racing gloves are designed. You can see these, these two fingers are attached. That's why I have these gloves here to simply show you that. Now this is what they would call a gauntlet glove. A gauntlet glove is gonna go up over the cuff of your jacket. It's gonna go up, uh, up over the bottom, the base of the sleeve. You can see this glove is tight. Again, pre-curved. You can see my hand is just relaxed in there. Pre-curved, two fingers connected together. I wear these even on the spider often in the winter time. In the summertime, these things are pretty darn hot, but if I'm on a sport bike, this is what I wear. If I'm on the Spider, some would say they're overkill. They're probably really not overkill. They're only overkill when you don't need them. But the, um, the SMX2 gloves, they're the ones. They're the ones for minimal protection. Um, 
that I believe are what you need. So next, what would that be? I think you see them sitting here. Boots. No, not army boots. No, not brogans. No, not um, a pair of Doc Martens. You can wear any and all of those if you want to. That's up to you. However, there are boots out there made by companies that look like the Doc Martens, that look like the army boots, that look like that, that actually have the proper armor within them. If I rode in what I really wanted to ride in, I'd ride in a pair of wrestling shoes. When I lift weights, when I work out, anything that I want my feet to be in contact with something, I'm wearing a pair of wrestling shoes. But when I'm riding a motorcycle, they don't afford any protection. This boot right here, this is the SMX 1R Vented boot. Now it's vented because you want them to be cool when you live in Florida. If you live in Michigan, you probably don't need the Vented boot. But I recommend the Vented boot. I'm going to tell you, I am more prone for my feet to be hot in the summer than unsufferably cold in the winter. And I've found that the vent makes a big difference in the summer and not a tremendous difference in the winter. Just me. So what makes this better than just a Doc Martin or any other boot for that matter? Well, you have a heel cup that protects your heel. That bone on the bottom of your heel, I had a friend of mine shatter that. It was a brutal injury where they screwed that heel bone back together. Many times those screws kept coming loose, kept getting infected, and he had real problems. And they thought for a while he could lose his foot. It got bad, it got very, very ugly. Heel cup, my favorite thing about these boots. Toe slider, right here, this toe slider is replaceable. However, it's nice and thick if you make the trip down the concrete. You have protection on the top, you have reinforced ankle, you have armor in the ankle, you have armor on the front, and it secures with a nice piece of Velcro and zips up on the side. And then Velcro's over the zipper. No string to get caught in a foot peg, a chain, or anything of that matter. I'm gonna tell you, as far as I'm concerned, and I have two pair of these boots. I have one that's all black, and I have this pair that has the black and the white on them. I believe in this boot. I love this boot. This is my everyday boot. I wear them. They're comfortable enough to walk in, but they're stiff enough to offer you protection. They're the minimal of what I would consider for protection really on a motorcycle. Next up, riding pants. Now, I know what you're saying, Bob. I can wear jeans and I'm fine. You probably are if you don't fall. Um, but if you do fall, jeans aren't enough. They're reinforced. It's thick. There's level one armor knee pads in them. It, they're hot in the summer. I'm going to tell you, these things are not cold in the summer. They're nice in winter riding. I'm going to tell you, they really are. But in the summertime, you're going to sweat a little more wearing these. But I wear them. I've got two pair. These are the Oakland Street and Steels. Um, I really believe in these. Um, they're, they're kind of a stretchy material. They are comfortable. I, I, Vicky kind of kids me, tells me I'm wearing my Justin Bieber pants. Um, what? But this would be the last thing, as far as I'm concerned. Helmet, jacket, gloves, boots, jeans, in that order. That's my order. May not be your order, that's okay. You can do it in any order you want. Invariably, in the end, this is what you want to wear when you ride. So step one to having a safe ride is put on your gear. The finger thing on the glove. I want to revisit that real quick. I saw a video here recently of a young man that pulled out, and I'm not gonna show the video because it's extremely graphic. He pulled out of a parking lot, rode in the lane. There was a car over here. He glanced over his shoulder, didn't see the car, went to make a U-turn, hit the car, and he flipped down the street. He was probably only doing 20 miles an hour. He was wearing fingerless gloves. And all I can say is he ended up like his gloves fingerless. He lost the pinky on one of his hands. Hi. I interrupted once. I'll do it again. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. How are I you? I heard someone cut off their pinky finger you're talking about. Yep. Don't want to do that. 
Don't want to do that. Don't lose a pinky. Then you can't be be fancy. You can't be suave oh, when you drink your that. coffee. No, not a man. Your man don't do that. I can't do it. This cough cup's too heavy to do it with. <laughs> That's cold coffee. That's cold coffee. <laughs> Have fun. I hope you're learning from Coach Bob. He's got a lot to teach you. You teach everybody how to keep it safe today? Yeah. I want them to live. I want them want to have them all of their appendages. Have fun. And feet and arms yeah. and legs. Yeah, that's good. All right. Paralysis ain't fun, is it? This is not about paralysis. <laughs> this isn't about paralysis. This is about being safe. Injury isn't fun, is it? No, but but you don't want to be injured. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I need to learn from the video because I don't like wearing all the gear either. I gotta go work out. Have right. fun, Coach Bob. So this young man, like his gloves, ended up fingerless. And when I say fingerless, what happened? The pinky on one of his hands was ground off, basically. It, it broke and then ground along the pavement. He lost his finger. Had he been wearing the proper gloves, I believe he would have not lost his finger. He would have broken it. There's no doubt he would have broken his finger. Um, had he been wearing those gauntlet gloves, he wouldn't have even broken his finger. But had, if he would have been wearing the regular Alpine Star gloves, his finger would have ended up broken, but he'd still have it. You have to do what you want to do. You have to assume the risk that you're, that you're going to assume in life in anything you do. So there it is. There's the gear. That's what you need every time you get ready to go on tour. So number two, let's talk about that right now. Now, number two won't come as a surprise to anyone who's ever been involved in the aviation industry, but for motorcycle people, certainly new motorcycle people, it may come as a surprise. Now, I know you're saying, why are you wearing sunglasses? I've got a light on this camera. It's pretty darn bright, and uh, <laughs> that's why. So, and what it is, it's a pre-ride checklist. Yes, a pre-ride checklist. Do you know your Can-Am owner's manual on page 100, at least for the 2019 model, I don't know, you can look uh, in the table of contents. It will tell you what your pre-ride checklist is. However, page 100 in this, do I do everything on the pre-ride checklist? Probably not. Do I do most of it? Yes. Do I feel that what I do is enough? If I didn't, I'd be doing more. So let's talk about what I do. You can put down in the comments below what you do, why you think you should do more, maybe why you think you should do less. And maybe some of the things you think that I'm doing are redundant and unimportant. And that's okay. That's why we have these conversations. The idea is not that I'm a know-it-all. It's that I'm going to give you what I know. You can give me something that you know in return. And between the two of us, we can come up with a solution. All right, so let's talk about the pre-ride checklist. Now, anyone who rides a spider knows about this little card. It, it basically tells you all the basic, hang on, you know, wear your safety gear, that sort of stuff. I find this pretty useless. I don't really use it. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Their checklist tells you to check that, but I really don't. What I do though, turn in the spider on, now, when it comes up, obviously, you're going to see your display. Um, you're going to look for any trouble lights. That's the very first thing you're going to do. You're going to crank it up. No, it's not 249. I haven't reset my clock. So let's crank her up. All right, so we have no trouble lights or anything of that nature. The first thing I do is I check my tires. Now, I'm, I've turned the spider off simply so I don't have to hear it running. However, the first thing that I do is I check my tires. I have the, the tire pressure monitor system so I can check the pressure. But I do a physical inspection. It's nothing big. It's nothing deep. It takes that long. I basically get down here. I look at the tread. I look at the tread depth. I look at the, the shape of the tire. I grab it. I shake it. You have three lugs. As long as it's not moving, I'm good. Come around here, do the same thing. Look at my lugs. My pressure is all right. I know that. And I'm just gonna grab the tire. I'm gonna look at it, feel the tread, look at the tread. If everything looks good, move it to the back. Do the same thing. I look back here, look at the tread, look at the wheel, look for any sort of disfigurement. I look at my belt while I'm back there. Is it centered? Is it rubbing? Any tear spots, anything like that. While I'm back here, I check my trailer, make sure all of that's done. So that's the first thing, tires. Pretty darn simple, nothing to it. Next thing I check is lights. I'll check each blinker in the front. I'll check them in the back. 
I also check them on the trailer. I do the left side, I do the right side. I make sure the cancellation is working on the button. I make sure my hazards are working. And at this point, the spider is running. I'm preparing to go. I'm making sure my headlights are working high and low beam. The very last thing I do before I get up, before I get on the spider, I walk around to every single compartment. In fact, I've been known to do this multiple times. And Coach Vic goes, you've already checked that. Right now I have the front loosely uh, open because I have my battery tender running. I'll grab the handlebar, I feel for any loose jostling, anything that's not supposed to be there, make sure my GPS is secure, make sure my phone is secure, make sure Coach Vic is secure, make sure her armrests are down, make sure the backrest is in position. I'll do all these things every single time. I check my oil every morning before going out. This is what I do just when I'm getting ready to ride. Do I do this at every stop? No, I don't. I do walk around the spider at every stop and I visually inspect everything and make sure everything's closed at every stop. But do I check the tires and all that? I really don't, I'm just being honest with you. But I check them every morning. Of course, I check my oil every morning, those sorts of things. Um, I do check the function of the brake as we're leaving the parking lot. I check it to make sure everything's working properly. Uh, I make sure that all of the modes, like the, I wanna make sure I'm not in economy mode, where if I need acceleration, I can get out of there. I'll check as I go in and out of reverse and through the gears. I'm feeling, I'm listening for grinding. I'm looking for trouble. I'm listening for trouble. The radio's off, the sound's off in my helmet. My face shield's up. I'm listening as we're accelerating and moving through that first series of cycles of everything that the motorcycle's going through. One of the things that I check every evening is I check to make sure that Coach Vic's footrests are secured properly. I always worry about them vibrating loose and because she can't feel her feet, she wouldn't know and her foot would be dangling. And that, would, that could be somewhat catastrophic. So I do, I go through, I've got a, a specific Allen wrench that is in my tool bag and I literally will just grab it. If it feels like it's loose at all, I just go boop and check it. And more times than not, it's just my paranoia. It's really not loose. So I'm gonna drop a picture right here of page 100 of the 2019 model. Your model may vary if you've got a 20, if you've got an 18, if you've got a 16, whatever. Go to your manual, get your checklist, memorize it, know it. Check it out, see what you're doing, what you could be doing differently. Also, every morning, every single morning, I wipe my glass down. Every stop, I wipe my glass down. So there you have it, the pre-ride checklist, that's what I do. Now I know there's some knucklehead out there going, hey coach, you didn't check to see if gas was in it. You know, if, if I gotta tell you that, well, we got problems. If you don't know to check your gas gauge, well, I don't know what to say. Um, coolant level, you can check your coolant level, those things, but I check my temperature gauge as long as I feel like I'm pretty good, I check it before I leave on a big trip, and I may check it every couple of thousand miles. So number three, what could number three be? We've got all of our gear on, we've done our walk around, we're all loaded up, we're ready to go. There's nothing else to do. This is the most overlooked thing in the motorcycle world. And I'm gonna tell you, this will save your life. I want you to do this every time you ride the rest of your life. Flip the switch. Flip the switch. You're not driving a car. You're not in a car. You're not protected. You're in the open. And what you're doing is inherently dangerous. You need to flip the switch. Get in the moment. In that moment, pay attention to what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. Think about how to maneuver the motorcycle, how to drive it, how to stop it, how to accelerate it. Think about your scan. Yes, actually systematically think about scanning for traffic. Think about where you're riding when you're riding behind a car, all of these things. You have to flip that switch and put yourself in this position to where you are mentally prepared to ride. It is vitally important. Every athlete I've ever coached, I always tell them, flip the switch. If you remember the old movie with Clint Eastwood, uh, Any Which Way You Can or Every Which Way But Loose, um, where they would 
flip the hat backwards. They were flipping a switch. That's what they were doing. You have to flip the switch in everything you do that is vitally important, where your physicality and where your, your, your reaction time could very well save your life or cost you your life. You need to flip the switch. Have a tradition, whatever that tradition is that tells you I'm ready to go. Every time I get on this motorcycle, when I'm doing this walk around, grabbing these things, you'll see me, when I get on a spider, I do one of these. I get like this and I kind of lean in. And when I do this, jostle, cycle the, I cycle the, the, the suspension and I sit down and I kind of move. And when I do, I'm looking straight ahead and my brain, my brain is connecting to this motorcycle and what I'm getting ready to do. Because I know that not only am I putting my life in my hands, I've got my wife back here most of the time and I'm putting her life in my hands and I don't take that lightly. Don't take it lightly. Riding is serious business. It's fun. I had a friend of mine, while we were out running this week, he told me, I had to quit riding my motorcycle to work. I was too tired when I got there. I was so engaged in what I did, I felt like that it was distracting me from doing a good job at work because I was having a hard time turning the switch off. It's hard. And remember, when you're doing long, long days, it's easy to get careless. When you stop and you put gas in that spider every hour and a half to two hours, you flip the switch again. Two hours later, you flip the switch again. Every time you get on that motorcycle, have a routine. It could be kissing an amulet. It could be turning your necklace. It could be twisting your ring. Do something, do something physical that makes you think about what you're doing and put your mind in that game. So there it is. Number one, your gear. Number two, your walk around. And number three, right there, flip that switch. All right, so there's your three. Th Woo, see, you thought I was going to tell you to slow down and ride more careful and do this and do that. Now, all those things are important. Don't get me wrong. But I think you understand now what I'm talking about and what you need to do. You know, when we go out on these long tours and we do these things, it's very easy to forget to do those things. It really is. You know, the, the, the daily grind um, that when you get up every morning, 4 o'clock, 4.30, uh, I get up very early to prepare things. As you know, mine and Coach Vic's life is just a smidge complicated at times, so I have to get up early and get those things done because if you lose an hour in the morning, you'll be looking for it all day. So I do my walk around early. I do it while I'm packing things. You know, I'll, I'll have the key out there with me. I'll, I'll flip the power switch on. I'll run through the blinkers and the brake lights and all that stuff while I'm checking things out. I'll check the trailer hitch. I do all those things while I'm, while I'm getting ready. The big thing that I think that we fail to do as motorcycle riders, I, I think a lot of us do that walk around and we do the gear but we don't flip the switch flipping the switch will save your bacon and your life <laughs> but what's a life without bacon right <laughs> all right But flipping that switch and having something that you do, something very, very simple, it's always a good thing. It's always a good thing. All right, well, I hope the world is treating you sweet and life is grand and you are riding like a motor scooting machine. <laughs> so do me a favor. Go out, yes you, by the motorcycle of your dreams, eat right, take care of yourself, and remember, if you're not having fun, you are most definitely doing it wrong. Now you go seize the day, because I am having a ball, I'm doing it right. I'll see you on the road real soon.